So it's that time again. Hey guys, Kenna here with Geologic Time. So today's notes are going to focus on kind of a brief history of the planet that we live on and how that led to the life that we have on it today. This is uh, commonly known in some circles as what we call deep time. And so we're going to take a quick look at deep time up to present time and kind of see how we got to now. All right. So here are our essential questions. Number one, what was the early earth like and where did all of our oxygen come from? Number two, what is the endosymbiotic theory? Try and break that word down. See if you can figure it out just from the word pieces. Endosymbiotic. Okay. Number three, what are the three geologic eras that follow Precambrian time and what periods are found in each? Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in and start looking at life on Earth. Now, if we take a look at the evidence we have of the early Earth's makeup, it probably was not as hospitable to life as we see today. The Earth's early atmosphere probably contained hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and water. Most of the things in that list are not very hospitable to life. And there was an experiment done by scientists Miller and Ure, who suggested that mixtures of these organic compounds that they believe are in the early atmosphere could have the materials needed to create primitive life. Okay. And so what their experiment suggested was that in this primordial soup, if you will, all of these organic elements were kind of floating around and they needed just the right conditions to kind of kickstart them and get them organized into a form that we're used to today. So what they did in their experiment was they created setups with these molecules in them, and then they started electroshocking them. And when they shocked them, they found that spontaneously on their own accord, some of these would organize into nucleotides, into, uh, you know, uh, amino acids, these precursor molecules that would eventually lead to things like uh, nucleic acids, proteins, etc. So they showed in their experiments that it was absolutely possible that the thunder and lightning that was likely present in those early atmospheric conditions could have organized the organic material into materials that would produce the life as we see today. But that's not the only hypothesis for how life could have arisen on our planet. If you're interested, there's a whole other theory called the panspermia hypothesis, and I'll let you go ahead and check that out on your own. From these organic molecules arose RNA and DNA, and there definitely is some evidence to suggest that RNA was actually first. There are some self-replicating RNAs that may have been the starter molecule for life as we know it on our planet. And molecular biologists have discovered that RNA is incredibly versatile. And so it can do a lot of different things. Think about all the things it does in our bodies. We don't just have one type of RNA. We have messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA. So they do a lot of different functions. And that some point in that history, as life is evolving with this RNA basis, it may have evolved into the DNA double helix-based life that we now see on our planet. But we still have in that primitive earth, this very inhospitable environment, okay, these gases in the atmosphere that would kill life as we know it today. So how did that change? And how did we get to the point where we have the atmosphere and the life that we see on our planet now? Well, the early earth had little to no oxygen. Okay, and fossil evidence suggests that photosynthetic organisms evolved from these very earliest life forms. Now, if you remember when we covered photosynthesis earlier, this is going to take that carbon dioxide that we saw in the atmosphere and convert it into what product? That's right, oxygen. And so at the time, there was nothing that used oxygen. And so you started to see a conversion of the carbon dioxide that was highly present in the atmosphere to production of oxygen, which had previously not been present. 
And so these photosynthetic organisms produce more and more oxygen and eventually the ozone layer. And we reached levels of oxygen in the atmosphere that were higher than what we see today. In fact, they were so high at one point that you had millipedes that were 10 feet long. You had scorpions and dragonflies that were larger than a man. A little terrifying to think of, but that was only possible because they get their oxygen in by quote unquote breathing through their skin. And so if the oxygen concentrations were high enough, they could get it in despite their size. But as the oxygen levels began to decline, as you got more and more of organisms that utilize that oxygen, and now we're starting to think about things like the mitochondria and the chloroplast, and we'll talk about them a little bit here in a second. But as you start developing cellular respiration and the levels of oxygen to carbon dioxide begin to balance out, that decline in the oxygen levels means that you can't have these ginormous scorpions or dragonflies because of the way that they get their oxygen. So the rise in atmosphere, atmospheric oxygen drove some life forms to extinction while other life forms evolved new, more efficient metabolic pathways. And so this is the story we've been telling, natural selection. As the environment changes, organisms must either adapt or go extinct, bringing the rise of new organisms to take place of those that were extinct. One thing that kind of comes out of this process as well is what's known as the endosymbiotic theory. So the endosymbiotic theory, endo means into, proposes that eukaryotic cells like ourselves and other animals arose from living communities formed by prokaryotic organisms and that some of those smaller prokaryotic organisms ended up being engulfed or consumed by the larger organisms. And as they came into the body of these larger cells, instead of destroying them, they found that they could benefit from them and kept them. And in fact, if you take a look at the mitochondria, if you take a look at the chloroplast, they actually have their own separate uh, DNA from what we have in our bodies. And that's just one of the things that we've seen along the history of our planet. Um, they're pretty amazing when we start to look at the evolution process and the life that we currently have on the planet today. Now, in order to kind of look at a little bit more of the recent time and the organisms as they start to develop in terms of what we think of as life on Earth, uh, we use what's called the geologic time scale. So paleontologists use divisions of the geologic time scale to represent, represent evolutionary time. This was originally developed as geologists studied the rock layers and index fossils. And they started beginning to go ahead and name these different time periods without actually having fixed dates set to them. Changes in the fossil record were used to mark where one segment ends and another begins long before we had any of these dates. Now, we went back and as we developed the radioactive dating we talked about last class, we started to add dates to these time periods. And these dates help give us a time, an idea of how old our planet actually is. And so this next image is going to show us kind of a history of our planet in terms of geologic time. Current estimates suggest that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, okay? And for the vast majority of that, there was no life on our planet, okay? Not, at least not life that we think of today. The oldest rocks on Earth don't actually show up until about 4 billion years ago because they had to have time to cool. Okay, and so then we get our first fossilized cells by about 3 billion years ago. But you've already had 1.6 billion years before that happens. And these are just simple, tiny little single-celled fossils. It's not until about 2 billion years ago that we start looking at the cells with a nucleus, the precursors of eukaryotic cells. Okay, so that's 2 billion years ago. So you've had 2.6 billion years ago. That's over half of the history of the planet that we live on 
before you get the cells that will eventually lead to us. Notice that you don't even have the Precambrian era until one billion years ago. So before that is really early deep time, okay? And about the time we get to the 543 million years ago, we get the Cambrian period, which is the first part of the Paleozoic era. Now, the Paleozoic era, we'll talk more about all of these later, so we're going to go quickly here, is known as the age of fish. These are almost completely aquatic organisms, and you don't start seeing land animals show up until you get to the Devonian about 410 million years ago. So at the end of the Paleozoic era, we see our first major extinction event. And that major extinction event is at the end of the Permian. So this is what's known as the Permian extinction. And at the end of the Permian, you begin with the Triassic, which goes into the Mesozoic. Now, <clears throat> this is the time of dinosaurs. You've got the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And before we even get into all of this, I know it's called Jurassic Park, but most of the dinosaurs that you see in the Jurassic Park movies are actually from the Cretaceous, and they pull dinosaurs from all the different time periods. And the Mesozoic era uh, goes until about 57 million years ago. Okay, so remember, we were originally talking in billions of years, but measurable time in terms of the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and later the Cenozoic doesn't show up until half a billion years, really, out of 4.6 billion years. So before we get really the life forms we think of as ancient life on Earth, you've already had 4 billion years of time pass. Okay, so we go through the age of dinosaurs, and at the end of the Cretaceous period, we have our next major extinction event. This is what's known as the KT boundary, and it separates the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic is the most recent era, and this is the time period that we live in. Okay. Now, the Cenozoic era is broken into two primary parts, the Tertiary and Quaternary. The Tertiary uh, goes through the evolution of mammals. This is the age of mammals. And humans don't actually show up as Homo sapien until about 0 0.01 million years ago. So in terms of all that 4.6 billion years of history of our planet, humans are only on it for the tiniest little fraction of time. And yet, at the same time, humans now have the ability to impact everything that happens on our planet, and in fact, the survival of the very planet itself. Now, where did these dates come from? So dates were added because of radioactive dating, and these ended up helping shift how big these time frames were, but the actual sequence of events didn't change over the time periods. They found that surprisingly, these sequences of rocks, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top, pretty much stayed that way, okay? The evidence from radioactive isotopes ended up supporting what was already theorized by the geologist. The oldest time scale is what we know as Precambrian time. And although there are a few multicellular fossils that exist from this time, it's mostly single-celled and it represents about 88% of the Earth's history. So 88% of the Earth's history, no real multicellular fossils. We're gonna focus then on what comes after Precambrian time. Now remember that only makes up about 12% of the Earth's history, it's a tiny fraction. But all the stuff we're going to talk about falls into that division. And we break it down into two parts, the eras, which I mentioned before, and the periods. Now, there are three eras following the Precambrian time. And I'll kind of walk us through them as we go. So the only real period of, of note that we kind of look at in Precambrian time is the Vendian period which is about 650 to 544 million years ago. 
The rest of it is going to be separated into three geologic eras. The oldest is what's known as the Paleozoic era. In fact, paleo, that prefix, means ancient. Zo, zoo, animal, right? And zoic, so Paleozoic, this is the ancient animal time period. This is followed by the Mesozoic, which is the age of dinosaurs. Meso, meaning middle. Zo, once again from zoo, meaning animal. So middle animal period. And then lastly, the most recent time period, the Cenozoic. Seno, meaning new. Zo, again, animal. And so this is the new animal era. So here's a list of those with the key time periods. So we can see in the Paleozoic, we have the Cambrian, followed by Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and then Permian. Mesozoic has Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And then the Cenozoic has the Tertiary and Quaternary. Let's go ahead and go through each one of these eras and talk a little bit about some key events. So the Paleozoic is bracketed by two of the most important events in the history of animal life. At the beginning is the big explosion in diversity. Okay? This produces the most different animals at one go ever. In fact, almost all of the animal phyla that are on the planet now appeared within a few million years. This dramatic explosion starts what will become the age of fish. This exists from about 542 to about 248 million years ago. And at the end of the Paleozoic, the single largest mass extinction in the history of our planet, which wiped out approximately 90% of all marine animal species on the planet. Okay, now remember, most of the animal species at this time were in the water. Very few made it to land by the end of this time period, this era. So roughly halfway in between, you develop animal kingdom, fungi, plantae, and these all took to the land. And in fact, during this window, we also see our first insects take to these guys. So early in the era, the fossil record becomes rich with evidence of many different marine type fossils. This is what's known as the Cambrian explosion. And many vertebrates and invertebrates live during this Paleozoic time period known as the age of fish. Now of note, I would like to point out is the Devonian time period. Why do I point to the Devonian? Because it was during that period that animals first began to invade the land. And this is important because before you can get animals on land, you have to have what? That's right, you have to have plants, okay? Because you need something to feed on. You need a place to lay your eggs. You need, there's a lot of features that these plants do that animals require. Okay, so remember, we begin with the Cambrian explosion during the Cambrian period. We then continue to see evolution of land, and, well, animal primarily at this time in the oceans and plants. And eventually you get to the Devonian time period, which sees your first land animals. At the end of the Paleozoic, you have our first mass extinction. This mass extinction was so bad that 95% of all complex life in the oceans disappeared. There are six time periods that we see in the Paleozoic. The Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. You might go ahead and star the Devonian. Remember, that's the one where we have our first land animals. The Carboniferous, which is actually made up of two sub-periods, the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. This is where most of the actual fossils that we see in the United States come from, is this time window. And then we get into the Permian. Okay, Remember, we have that first major extinction, the Permian extinction. Cambrian explosion, Permian extinction. So here's that geologic time scale. We already did Precambrian time. Now we're looking at the Paleozoic. Next, we move on to the Mesozoic. Meso, remember, means middle animals. There's a big change uh, during which the world fauna 
were drastically altered. So flora and fauna, flora represents plants, fauna represents animals. This is the rise of dinosaurs. Probably the most popular organisms of the Mesozoic. They evolved in the Triassic, but we're not super diverse until we get into the Jurassic. And except for birds, dinosaurs became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous time period. We do see the first arrival of mammals, and this happens late in the Cretaceous, but they don't really begin to take off until we get after the Mesozoic and into the next time era. Okay. So this era is typically referred to as the age of reptiles or the age of dinosaurs, as this is when dinosaurs ruled the world. But before we kind of just keep moving on, looking at the animal species, I think it's very important to go ahead and highlight the importance of plants here. I mentioned it with the Devonian, before you get your land animals, you have to get your land plants. But the land plants actually make some big changes during this time period as well. The early Mesozoic is dominated by huge fern forests and some unusual plants that closest relatives we have right now are probably uh, what we would call horsetails. Okay. During this time period, we see the rise of the modern gymnosperm. Gymnosperms are your cone-bearing plants, such as conifers. They first appear uh, in a recognizable form around the Triassic time period. And by the middle of the Cretaceous, we have our first flowering plants. This includes all of your grasses, your trees that we typically think of when we think of plants on our planet. Okay. This began to diversify tremendously and the flowering plants, our angiosperms, really kind of take over um, and they make up the vast majority of plants on our planet at this point in time. So the Mesozoic is divided into three periods, the Triassic, which is first, followed by the Jurassic, and then the Cretaceous. At the end of the Cretaceous, we have our next major extinction event, the end of the dinosaurs, what they call the KT boundary, and that moves us into the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic is most recent of all the major divisions of animal history and spans only about 65 million years, which is a tiny fraction if you think about the fact that our planet is about 4.6 billion years old. This is from the end of the Cretaceous and the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs to now. And the Cenozoic is often called the age of mammals because the largest land animals have been mammals during this time period. However, the history of mammals began before the Cenozoic. Remember, we talked about it in the Mesozoic but they diversified and filled a lot of the niches on our planet during this window. During the Cenozoic, mammals evolve and adapt to live all over the planet and land, water, even in the air, if we think about bats. And these are the tertiary, which makes up the bulk of the Cenozoic. And then the most recent tiny little sliver is saved for the quaternary time period. And this is the period in which we reside. So there you go, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Mesozoic's made up of Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. We have another major extinction event, which ends the era. That's the KT boundary between the Cretaceous and Tertiary. Then we have the Cenozoic, which is the modern era made up of two time periods, the Tertiary and Quaternary, most of which is the Tertiary. And in the most recent sliver, we find humans in the Quaternary. So here we go again, we've got our different ages. Remember Precambrian time is really just simple, single-celled. We don't really see any multicellular organisms until we get into the Paleozoic, which begins with the Cambrian explosion where most of the different classes and kingdoms of life arise. We go through the Ordovician Silurian before we get to the Devonian, which is when we get our first land animals. We have the Carboniferous and then finishing off the Paleozoic with the Permian. We have our first major extinction. This is probably the largest extinction in the history of our planet where we lose about 90 to 95% of all aquatic species. After that, we start seeing a rise in land animals. This begins in the Mesozoic. Mesozoic is the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Your dinosaurs show up in the Triassic period. They diversify in the Jurassic, 
and then mammals come for the first time in the late Cretaceous time period before the major extinction event of the KT boundary, which ends non-avian dinosaurs and moves us into the Cenozoic, which is the age of mammals. Now the age of mammals, they are different ways to look at the time periods here. We're gonna focus on the tri, um, tertiary and quaternary, okay? So you see here, Neogene and Paleogene. Just go ahead and remember, we wanna focus on Triassic. I mean, not Triassic, tertiary. And then quaternary is the smallest, most recent section in which we live. Now I mentioned a couple of times that we had some mass extinction events. Now, extinctions occur all of the time. And there are more than 90, no, excuse me, more than 99% of all species that have ever lived on our planet are now extinct. You make up less than 1% of the species that are currently on the planet, which makes up a tiny fraction of what's ever been here. These mass extinction events are episodes where many species suddenly become extinct. Most definitions for this recommend that we're losing about three quarters of the species on the planet. So the smaller extinctions are, are still important and still have pretty big extinctions. You see these little arrows pointing towards what we would consider mass extinctions, the biggest of which are at the end of the Paleozoic with the Permian extinction, and at the end of the Cretaceous time period, the KT boundary. But we've had definitely a lot of mass extinctions. Until recently, most researchers look for a single major cause, such as an asteroid striking our planet. But some paleontologists now think that there's a coupling of several events that cause these major mass extinctions, including volcanoes erupting, continents moving, sea levels changing, the list goes on and on. And so when we start looking at the history of life on Earth, I hope you realize just how special it is that you're here and that we value our time here and appreciate all that's come before you to lead to this moment right now, okay? 4.6 billion years of evolution on our planet have led from single-celled organisms to the age of fish, to the age of reptiles, to the age of mammals. And the age of mammals gives rise to this tiny little sliver called the quaternary period in which humans reside, okay? All right, guys, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care of yourselves. We'll talk to you soon. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.